Joining us to discuss seasonal affective disorder in this week's Your Health segment is Dr. Theodore Postolake, professor of psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and psychiatrist with the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. This is formally known not as the winter blues, but as seasonal affective disorder. What's the, the range there? Is it severe in some and, and a minor irritation in others? Yes, so um, I think it's important to differentiate between uh, its impact on functioning, on functioning, work functioning, academic functioning, um, and um, it could be quite considerable uh, for uh, those um, individuals who have indeed a full-blown seasonal affective disorder. Uh, and then we also have um, minor forms, they, this may consist of um, feeling a little bit sleepy, feeling less energized, having an increased uh, appetite, uh, putting on weight, um, eating carbohydrates a little bit more. Um, for instance, in my office, many times I have patients waiting and uh, having uh, candies in the office, in the waiting area, and so you can count the number of wraps people open. Um, you studied this by, by season? Uh, we haven't studied exactly the number of wraps, but we did study indeed appetite changes by season. And uh, indeed there is uh, quite a bit of um, an increase in uh, body mass uh, in patients with uh, uh, winter depression. Also we have um, you know, an elevation in lipids, uh, in uh, glucose, so there is an elevation potentially in a cardiovascular uh, risk overall. Uh, but then I think the main uh, differentiation would be um, between what we would call holiday blues and then seasonal affective disorder or maybe winter blues. Well, maybe one way to separate that is to look at what happens to people in the southern hemisphere where uh, the longest days are at this time of year, so they would figure to experience these symptoms in July and August, does that happen? Excellent, it's, it's exactly one model in, uh, of studying epidemiologically um, the concordance versus the divergence between the South and, uh, uh, and the Northern Hemisphere. But all in all also, uh, people who tend to have holiday blues tend also to have similar symptoms and other times um, when um, either People at large celebrate um, festivals, um, religious festivals, for instance, or um, when uh, there is an anniversary, uh, let's say an anniversary of um, marriage or maybe uh, birthdays. So there is a tendency for uh, certain individuals psychologically to react with uh, sadness or even depression around uh, those particular time points. For, for people for whom it's more seasonal as opposed to holiday or anniversary related, some of it sounds normal in my experience. I always put on a few pounds in, in the winter and, and I'm, I'm exercising less and it doesn't, it's not that big a deal. It feels normal to me. When, when does this cross over into being something that's, that's a serious issue? So um, the way we speculate, the way we hypothesize about this is that this, these changes have been in fact adaptive at some time in the past during uh, evolution, evolution in mammals and in human evolution. Um, and the, indeed the, the point- We used to hibernate perhaps? <laughs> I, uh, I don't think humans hibernate. I mean primates um, uh, and even um, um, apes in, uh, when brought in temperate conditions, they tend to have seasonal changes, but they do not really amount to a full hibernation and yet what happens is that many times um, there's a tendency to anticipate, to anticipate, the ch not to react to only, but to anticipate winter energetic bottlenecks, um, the demands of um, low temperatures, the decreased availability of food uh, leads to a reduction in uh, general activity, potentially sexual activity in many animals and um, conserving energy. 
uh, for uh, survival. Um, and so um, um, under the current conditions, this may be, of course, less adaptive. Uh, and I would say that um, the line will be drawn if there is a significant impact on uh, functioning and on health. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about the winter blues, seasonal affective disorder, you can give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You could also tweet your questions. The Twitter address is at MPT News. So for patients for whom it is a problem, what remedies do you have had? I've, uh, I've heard of uh, light boxes. Does that work? Yes, light boxes do work. Um, and uh, I think um, we, know, we could separate uh, the type of remedies that have uh, controlled studies, uh, randomized controlled studies to support their um, uh, role. So uh, light treatment um, developed in the 90s um, is definitely uh, helpful. Uh, we also have uh, pharmacological agents. Um, bupropion was FDA approved for the treatment of seasonal affective disorder, but there are some other medications that are being used. And more recently, cognitive behavioral therapy, in fact, manualized for seasonal affective disorder, has shown some uh, very good results, um, both when compared to uh, controls as well as when compared in parallel with light treatment. Does a, uh, a week in the islands at the, at the beach for people who have the time and the resources to do that make a difference for somebody? So we should uh, test that, and I'll volunteer. But go yes, ahead. yes, yes. You know, it'll be a nice study. I'm quite sure uh, many, many indeed people would volunteer for it. Um, the the context, the the background that would support that idea is that although light treatment is effective, and each of these modalities is ineffective, none of them really makes people with seasonal affective disorder, full-blown seasonal affective disorder, feel as well after treatment than in the summer. So that leads to combination of treatments, but also leads to the concept that there is something potentially uh, in the summer that uh, may uh, really be uh, necessary for a more complete response. And there have been indeed uh, certain attempts to look uh, not as a randomized controlled trial, but indeed like travel to the south uh, in the northern hemisphere has shown by self-report that has a potentially positive effect. There have been also attempts to look at smell uh, factors. Uh, in fact, smells of uh, summer, the fact that there is a deprivation or factory deprivation in the winter. Of course, there have been attempts to, to look at temperature uh, and sauna, you know, or maybe hot tea and uh, all that, but we don't have definitive um, uh, information about the efficacy of those. Let's take a phone call here. Uh, Arlington, Virginia, this is Marilyn. Marilyn, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Uh, so my question is that in the fall, late October and certainly into uh, Christmas, that it takes me three times as much mental energy to get anything done. So it's affecting my mental processing, and I want to know if that's related to seasonal affective disorder. Thank you for the phone call. Symptom? Yes, so, so um, it looks like, uh, from what I understand, is that everything that needs to be done is done, but with much more uh, effort. And um, we have seen this uh, also in uh, students in DC in a study we published, in fact, in the American Journal of Psychiatry um, in college students um, during finals, where um, in a situation in which students were sacrificing sleep duration in order to um, achieve um, the, the task necessary uh, to prepare the, the exams. So uh, how to differentiate it, however, there are many reasons that may contribute to such a symptom. Seasonal affective disorder may be one of them, but there may be some other uh, conditions, medical conditions, uh, for instance, that would have to be looked at before concluding that this is in this seasonal affective disorder. So I'll give some examples. So it could be, let's say, a low tirade function that may have, for some reason, uh, a trigger uh, in, in the fall. Uh, there are sometimes allergies that occur in uh, late uh, summer, beginning of fall, initially ragweed and then spores. Uh, allergies themselves uh, could lead, uh, lead to directly to a sense of 
um, of fatigue. Uh, and so all these things would have to be uh, taken into account and sorted out by a professional, a medical professional in my view. Let's take another phone call. In Arundel County, this is David. David, thank you for calling. Go ahead. How you doing? This is my fourth time caller. I have a question, doctor. How do you separate the diagnosis and treatment of someone that has seasonal affective disorder from someone that has bipolar disorder from season, maybe in a four to six month span to season? Great question, I mean, David. It, it can happen at any time. It can happen in August, I mean, at any season, the right. bipolar. But sometimes it happens, and mainly it happens in, in, in the colder months. How do you separate that as a doctor? So, so first of all, I would say that uh, in this field, there are um, um, people, there are, there are authors that uh, consider seasonal affective disorder as being on the spectrum of bipolarity. So, uh, and so it's an excellent question. I really appreciate uh, the question because it uh, not only raises the issue of how we separate, but also how we integrate and also if we treat it differently. So um, there is, there is a, a consideration like this, a view that a seasonality is linked with bipolarity. In fact, we completed a study in the Old Order Amish published last year, and we found that it was a genetic overlap between uh, certain um, uh, genetic configurations for bipolar disorder and seasonal affective disorder. So there is a di distinct overlap that we can found genetically. Now, in terms of the um, uh, separation per se, um, I think uh, from a treatment standpoint, it's very important to diagnose that indeed there have been some episodes of high energy. Uh, we def differentiate bipolar disorder in bipolar one disorder, where there is a functional impairment between this kind of elevation in energy, mood, uh, potentially irritability or elation, and bipolar two disorder, where there is no elevation, no, no impairment uh, because of that. The implication is that once we have this um, bipolar one situation where the elevation uh, may lead to a decrease in functioning, we have to treat it differently. So we have to use, in addition to the means that I have already listed, we should use also mood stabilizers, um, medications that may create not only a floor for mood, but also a ceiling. Doctor, let me get to another phone call from Anne Arundel County. This is George. George, thank you for the call. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm interested in whether there have been any studies showing uh, whether there's a difference between uh, having the uh, sunlight being absorbed uh, with the eyes open and going through the optic nerve system into the brain versus a group that uh, had sun exposure that was only on the skin with their eyes closed. Uh, George, thank you very much. Good question. Does the light box work if your eyes are closed? So, so historically, the very first, um, um, uh, the first studies with light treatment uh, at the National Institutes of Health, Thomas Ware, Norman Rosenthal, they have in fact addressed exactly that question. And there are some very nice slides. Uh, they looked a little bit strange, in which uh, people really had like um, uh, uh, boxes, like really kind of fitted over their head to cover skin or to cover eyes. And what, what distinctly, the answer? the answer is that only through the eyes this uh, did light uh, help. Now, this being said, there has been a study in science published very highly uh, showing that, in fact, light to the back of the knee may have certain effects no on kidding. the physiology imply that, that is involved in SAD. But then all subsequent studies were not able to replicate that, that particular finding. So it is considered more like an artifact. And of course, if we look at light in a broad way, like if we include the UV light, ultra, uh, UV light, um, uh, the UV radiation is uh, increasing vitamin D synthesis in the skin, 
There have been studies showing that an adequate uh, level of vitamin D is important to adequately control seasonal affective disorders. So if we think about light in a, in a global way, uh, not only the visible light, but also the UV light, then yes, it is possible that the light to the skin and then travel to the south and all that may be uh, effective uh, through UV light and vitamin D production. Well, the good news is that uh since today is the shortest day of the year, tomorrow is going to be a little bit longer, and the day after that is a little bit longer, so the trend is good. Yes, yes, definitely. This, this is, in fact, the basis for the cognitive behavioral therapy of SAD <laughs> is to kind of to promote uh, also the, uh, you know, when, when there is depression, you always see the negative as being very big, the positive very small, and so being able to dilate the positive, just like you said, is therapeutic in itself. I already spring, feel better spring just like Spring is it. around, well, it's the television lights uh, help with that. Yes, there. indeed, these lights could indeed uh, do quite a bit for- Dr. Uh, Theodore Postolake, University of Maryland, thank you for coming by. Thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System.